All right, so why don't we do the first one? Uh, let's see here. So, <coughs> so what rule do we use here? The power rule, right? The power rule for antiderivatives. So what would that be? That would be 5x squared. squared, right? So you add 1 to the exponent. So squared and then divided by 2, right? OK, now this one, <coughs> this one right here, you want to, uh, before you get the antiderivative, what should you do? Move it up, right? As x to the, write it as x to the minus 5, right? So we can maybe do that. OK, so then what would that be, the antiderivative of that? So if I rewrite this, this would be plus 2 thirds, right? And then x to the, if I add 1, what would I get? Yeah, negative 4, right? Negative 4, and then divided by negative 4. So far, so good? OK. And then just if we simplify this a little bit, so this would be 5 halves x squared, uh, and then minus the 2 and the 4 reduced to 1 and 2, right? So that what would that be? That would be 1 over 6, and then x to the 4th on the bottom, right? OK, am I done? Plus c, that's right. Do not forget the plus c. OK, so that's the antiderivative. And remember, you can always test, right? So if you get the derivative of this function, you should get the f of x that you started off with, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so the second one we have, all right, so remember this right here. So notice uh, we cannot do the power rule uh, for, so no power rule. Um, when you have, when the exponent is, so if you move it up, it would be x to the minus one, right? So you cannot do the power rule uh, because you would get x to the zero divided by zero, and that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? Uh, so what is it? Well, remember that the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x, right? So you have to just kind of remember that, uh, that uh, if you have 1 over x or a constant over x, then the antiderivative would just be, so in this case, 2 ln of the absolute value of x. Yeah? Okay. Now, the next one, uh, this one, a lot of students uh, mix this up, um, but it's not very difficult. You just have to be careful. Um, so what's the antiderivative of 4 to the x? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's 4 to the x and then divided by the natural log of 4, right? Does that make sense? You guys have a question? No, so yeah, that's a common confusion. So, um, so notice it's four to the x, so this is an exponential function. So uh, like if you were to get the derivative of four to the x, you don't use the power rule here, right? you use the rule for the derivative of exponential functions, which would be 4 to the x times natural log of 4, right? So notice the x does not come down or anything like that. So when you're getting the antiderivative, that's why you divide by ln of 4 so that it would cancel out with that ln of 4 that you get right there. Yeah. And then, um, this is, it doesn't Gotcha. Uh, no, because it's a constant multiplying my function. So, uh, okay, so here. So if I had, for example, uh, three, so let's say you had three plus four to the x. So the antiderivative of this would be three x plus four to the x over ln of four. 
right? Because you're adding three. But in this case, three is just a constant that's multiplying your function. So that's why you just take it out uh, and you get the antiderivative of the function itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like if right here you do a test, let's say. So like if you test, test. What's the derivative of uh, 2ln of x plus 3 times 4 to the x over ln of 4? So what would this equal to? This would be, so notice the 2 just stays there, right? It's a constant. So the 2 is multiplying ln of x. So it would be 2 times 1 over x, right? And then uh, plus, and again, you're getting the derivative, and then you have the constant 3 times, well, it's really the constant, so it's really 3 over ln of 4 is your constant, right? Does that make sense? And then you multiply that times the derivative of 4 to the x, which is 4 to the x times ln of 4, right? Does that make sense? So then the ln of 4s cancel, and so then you get that this is correct, right? Well, you could do the quotient rule, but you don't have to because ln of four is a constant. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you yeah, so if you did the quotient rule, it would be okay, except that it would take you much longer to get to the same spot. So ln of a constant is just a constant. Yep. Not one. Right. Yeah. So ln of a constant is a constant. Yeah. Why is Any other questions? No? That's okay? Okay, so um, this, the third one, uh, here notice that uh, this one over 2t, so you might be tempted to just say, well, the antiderivative of this is uh, ln of 2t, but that's not actually quite right. Because notice, if I get the derivative of that, uh, you would get what one over two t, right? And then times, you'd have to use a chain rule, right? So you you would multiply by the derivative of two t, which is two, and notice that does not give you one over two t, right? So so that is well, that's not an x as in the variable x. That's an x as in uh, that's the incorrect antiderivative. Um, over four. Oh, you mean like, like this? Um, you mean the antiderivative of one over two t being ln of two t all divided by two? Um, well, yes and no, sort of. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, so the, the answer is that uh, you have to be a little bit careful. So here, let, let me explain. So uh, what you want to do instead is look at this as being 1 half times 1 over t. And then it makes sense exactly what to do, right? Because what is 1 half is a constant, right? So uh, when you get the antiderivative of that, you have 1 half times, and then the antiderivative of 1 over t, which is ln of t. Does that make sense? Um, OK. Plus, uh, and then root 2, again, that's a constant, right? So I just leave it alone. 
And then what's the antiderivative of e to the t? e to the t, good. Am I done? Plus c, right? Oh, and I forgot plus c over here. OK, now, uh, so the question brought, brings up an interesting point. OK, so I want to make this comment. Very interesting. And what you need to do is you need to kind of file this under, this is like something that maybe will trip you up at some point. Um, and so you have to file it in your brain somewhere where that where those kinds of things fit. Um, so the question is, so you have, um, so let's use the, the same function as an example, one over two x. And so when we were kind of messing around with this, we said, well, it's not that, right? That's incorrect. But is that correct? Well, we know that, well, actually, we know the correct answer to this, right? What's the correct antiderivative of 1 over 2x? That's what we just did, right? It's 1 half ln of x, right? So then does that mean that ln of 2x over 2 is incorrect? So we know this is correct. There's no doubt, right? This, well, actually, no, not that. Uh, plus c. This is correct, right? That's the correct antiderivative. That's the one we just found. We had a t instead of an x, right? But what about ln of 2x over 2? So if I do a test and I get the derivative with respect to x of ln of 2x over 2, what is that? Well, it's 1 half, right? times 1 over what? 2x times, all right, what's that? Hmm, is that not exactly what we were, that's the function we were looking for, right? Well, hmm, are those the same function, those two? Is this function because notice, it, is it an antiderivative then? ln of 2x over 2. Well, sure it is, right? Because didn't we just show that when you get the derivative of ln of 2x over 2, you get 1 over 2x? So it is an antiderivative, right? OK. <laughs> How is that possible? Notice also, OK, so here, even more weird even more strange Okay, what do you guys think about that? Is ln of 32.5x divided by 2? Of the first one. The, fir the same exact problem. Well, what do you do? Well, test. Right? <laughs> okay, see, this is why I wrote this down in a completely separate sheet of paper virtual paper. Um, so what's the, so we're getting the derivative of this, right? ln of 32.5x divide, all divided by 2. All right, what's the derivative of that? <laughs> 1 half times 1 over 32.5x times 32.5, right? What is that? Wowzers, right there. Wow. So really, it could be any number in there, right? And it would come out. So what's going on? I mean, how is this possible? Because So we know that there are 
So if you take a function, how many antiderivatives are there of that function? Infinitely many, right? Because you always have the plus C, so you can add a one or a two or a three or a four or a seven or a 11, whatever you want, you can add any number to the, the general antiderivative and then you would get that would still be an antiderivative, right? Yes? Okay, so the, the key to realizing that you can put any number in here, it doesn't matter if it's two, 32 and a half or a million, is to do a rewrite that ln of 2x over 2 is the same as uh, ln of x, and then what else? Think of the laws of logarithms. If the 2 and the x are being multiplied, then what do you do when you break them up? You add them, right? Is this not ln of x plus ln of 2? Like that? Those are exactly the same, right? So then notice, that what is that right there? That's a constant. So because here you can add an arbitrary constant, uh, so having this 2 inside the parentheses is like as if you were adding some constant. And since it's arbitrary, it doesn't matter what number it is, uh, it's always going to come out as an antiderivative, right? So like for example, this one right here, uh, if I were to rewrite this, uh, this would be 1 half ln of 32.5 plus ln of x, right? That would be this one. Ah. Well, isn't this the same as 1 half ln of x plus 1 half ln of 32.5? Like that. And notice if you compare this to the uh, general antiderivative, is that the same? It is, right? It's just this is a general antiderivative, right? An arbitrary constant, and this is a specific one. So they're both antiderivatives. Uh, so that's why we ended up with two antiderivatives that didn't look like they should be antiderivatives, but it ends up that they are both, right? So pretty crazy, right? Pretty crazy. Okay. All right, so keep that filed in your brain somewhere. You might encounter a case when you're like, oh, you know, like when you're doing homework and, or, well, if you're doing a problem where the answer's in the back of the book and then you're like, oh, this is right, but the book has something else. Sometimes it's something as simple as uh, something like that where the constant and some other constant kind of get melded into one arbitrary constant kind of thing. Yeah, Alex. So the second part is wrong because the other part is specific wrong? No, it's not really. Yeah, that's the thing. It's not really wrong. Um, I mean, I guess if you wanted, I mean, you could say, for example, so this right here is a is an antiderivative. Uh, but you can also say that, for example, this plus C is the general antiderivative. Uh, it's just that that plus C and then the, or basically the natural log, you can break it up. And so the constant part of the natural log can get combined with the arbitrary constant to form just an arbitrary constant. Gets kind of gobbled up. You know, so like for example, if I have a constant C, well that's a constant, right? So that represents an arbitrary constant. But if I say, okay, well, you have c plus 4, and I call that something else, say d, well, that's still an arbitrary constant, right? So unless you have more information, there's nothing to find, you know. Does that make sense? So like if you had specific information, 
about this whatever your function represents, then you may be able to find uh, the constant c, or in this case d, or whatever. Uh, but when you're just finding the general antiderivative, either one is fine as long as you have the plus c in there, because then you're adding an arbitrary function. So it's a little bit strange, but I think it'll be more clear as we work more with them. Um, it'll become more clear what what the role of the plus c is and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So see, that's why very interesting, right? Very interesting. Okay. So number four is easy. Uh, you just have to remember the antiderivative, right? So what's the antiderivative of cosecant squared x? Negative cotangent x. And what's the antiderivative of secant x tan x? Secant x, right? So it would be minus secant x, right? Plus c. Right. Don't forget your plus c. Okay, now the next one, um, you need to recall some, some stuff here. So trig identity is very important to know your trig identities. Um, so what is cosine of 2x equal to? So it's the double angle formula for cosine. <coughs> what would that be? Anybody remember? Okay, cosine squared x minus sine squared x. Um, but probably not as useful. Um, <coughs> so you can do that, but that looks like it's going to make it worse, right? <coughs> you guys agree with that? Um, so why don't we instead, so remember that sine squared x plus cosine squared x is equal to 1, right? That's the Pythagorean identity. So then that means that um, so if you, for example, well, I don't know. It doesn't really matter which one, but um, you can say that sine squared x is 1 minus cosine squared x, right? If you plug this into the sine squared x, what would you end up with? Cosine 2x equals 2. You'd have 2 cosine squared x, right? Because it's minus a minus cosine squared, right? And then plus 1 or minus 1? Minus 1, right? Okay, well, notice this replaces cosine of 2x. So then if I rewrite f of x, what would that be? 1 over 1 plus 2 cosine squared x minus 1, right? Which is what? 2 cosine squared x, right? which is another way of saying one half what? What's one over cosine squared x? That's secant squared, right? And do we know the antiderivative of secant squared x? Sure we do, right? So this would be one half tangent of x plus c. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, any questions about that one? No? Okay. Let's do the last one. Uh, uh, let me, let me, uh, we're going to need more space. So, um, the last one says, if the second derivative uh, is root x, uh, find f of x. Uh, so notice we haven't done a problem like this before. 
But if we're gonna, uh, but it's basically we need to go backwards twice, right? So you have a function, you get its derivative. That's the first derivative. You get its derivative again. That's the second derivative. So you just need to find the antiderivative two times, right? Uh, so it's not very difficult. Um, so we start off by finding the first derivative, which would simply be the antiderivative of root x, which is what? So root x is x to the 1 half, right? So then add 1, which would give you 3 halves, right? And then times 2 thirds, right? That's the antiderivative of root x, right? Or x to the 1 half. OK. So now what? Do it again. Well, we're missing something. We are going to do it again, but we're missing something. Plus c, right? OK, now it might seem like uh, it's irrelevant. And why put the plus c there? But actually, it does matter. Because um, so here, the next step, notice we get the antiderivative, right? So what would that be? x to the 5 halves, OK, times 2 fifths, right? OK, so if I multiply 2 thirds times 2 fifths, I'm going to get 4 fifteenths, right? Yes or no? OK, good. All right, and then plus what? Nope. Nope. So c is a constant, right? Cx, exactly. So c is some constant that I got from getting the antiderivative of the second derivative, right? Then I get its antiderivative. So it's just a constant again. So when you get the antiderivative of just a constant, it's that constant times x, right? But I'm also missing something else. Is that correct? Mm -mm. So the idea is correct. You need to add a constant, but it's not the same exact constant from the previous one, right? So you have to give it some other letter. So I'm, I'm going to just put D, but it could be anything. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just re re it represents an arbitrary constant, but if you put plus C, well, you're saying it's the same constant from the previous one, which makes no sense whatsoever. And um, so it just has to be some different constant. So you can put plus a, plus b, plus, just don't put plus x, obviously. Um, and, then, and then you're good. Does that make sense? Because you're getting the antiderivative of, of c is cx. Does that make sense? OK, so um, remember that, let's say you have distance and uh, some distance function. Uh, so typically we use s. Honestly, I have no idea why we use s, but we do. So. S it represents the distance, and so we're talking about uh, rectilinear motion, so motion in one direction. Um, and uh, what is the velocity? So the velocity function is the first derivative, right? So the derivative of the distance function gives you the velocity, right? What about the acceleration? second derivative of. So the acceleration function is the derivative of the velocity or the second derivative of the distance function, right? You guys remember that? So it's been a while, but we use that. So let's use it uh, backwards. All right, so we have, um, you know, let's say some particle moving along here. And um, the acceleration is 1 over root t. Um, and uh, let's say you want to find the position function. Now notice, not only do are we given the acceleration function, but also notice we 
uh, we're given the velocity and the position at different points in time, right? So what are we going to use um, these for to find the constants exactly? So notice in the previous problem, the one we just did, we had the second derivative of a function, right? And then we found the original by getting the antiderivative twice. But notice we were left with two arbitrary constants in there. Uh, that's because we didn't have any information about the first derivative or the function. But here we do have information. So that's going to allow us to find uh, those constants. Does that make sense? Okay, so you can always find the constants as long as you have information about the antiderivative. If you don't have any information, any specific information, uh, then you can't find it. Yeah? All right, so uh, let's see here. So... Um, what should I do? That's exactly right. Okay, so uh, we find the antiderivative of A, which is going to be V, right? So the antiderivative of the acceleration is going to lead me to the velocity function, right? Okay. <coughs> So what is the antiderivative of 1 over root t? So maybe uh, 1 over root t is t to the minus 1 half, right? Okay, so then what would that be? The antiderivative of that? t to the 1 half, right? And then what? Uh, there is a plus c, but what else? Not over 2. Two. Times 2, right? So t to the 1 half, right? And then divided by a half or multiplied by the reciprocal, which is 2, right? OK, so all right. So now, um, so at this point, what we want to do is we want to use the fact that v of 4 equals to 2 to find c. So how do I do that? We'll just plug it in, right? So if I plug it in, what am I going to get? I'm going to have, on the left side, what will I have? 2, right? So 2 equals to 2 times, what goes in the parentheses there? 4. and then plus c. So that implies that c is going to equal to what? If I solve for c, what do I get? Negative 2, right? OK, so then that means that the velocity function, in this case, is exactly equal to 2t to the 1 half and then minus 2. Does that make sense? OK, but that's not the actual question, right? The question is, what is s of t, so the distance function? So uh, what would I do there? Take the antiderivative of v, right? So the antiderivative of v is going to be s. So what would that be? That's going to be t to the three halves, right? And then times two thirds times two. So that would be four thirds. And then minus what? Two t, right? The antiderivative of minus two. So minus two t. Okay, now I know that everyone is tempted and would like to do this. Resist the temptation. What is wrong with that? I just set up here that c is minus 2. And then down here, you put a c there. So what does that mean? Well, then that means that there should be a minus 2 there, right? But no. So I know you don't, even if you write a plus c there, I know you don't mean that it's a plus c. I know that you just like writing plus c. But just do me a favor and write a different letter. So d, or anything, any other letter, it's fine. Just not the one that you just used. 
Because it's going to be a different number, right? Almost all, every single time. Okay, now can I find D? Do I have enough information to find D? Sure I do, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to use the fact that S of 0 equals to 5, right? That's this information right here. To find what? Find D, exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah? Any questions? Okay. So then if I plug it in, what do I get? I get 5 is 0 minus 0 plus D. So D equals to 5. Okay. So then in the end, this is my answer. S of T is equal to 4 thirds t to the 3 halves minus 2t and then plus 5. Alright, so what do you guys think? Does that make sense? Is that clear? Pretty clear? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, just like when you started learning how to find derivatives, you had to practice and practice and practice, and then once you practice a bunch, is finding derivatives difficult now? No, right? It's second nature. So same thing with antiderivatives. You know, practice, 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 and then eventually it'll get not as easy as derivatives, but easier than it feels now. No? Okay.